There is no way that the United States can reindustrialize as long as it's leaving health care, education, and other basic needs as privatized to be paid out of the labor budget instead of by the government. Germany's economic philosophy has always been to shrink demand, and that's because it was basically designed at the University of Chicago by anti-labor economists, specifically to prevent Europe from ever becoming an independent economic power that would be a rival to the United States economy. I refer often to Martin Luther King in the context of the civil rights movement. He said, I have no time for the tranquilizing drug of gradualism and incrementalism. Taking money from our children and borrowing from China. People are dying. Is the program so critical, it's worth borrowing money from China to pay for it? And if not, I'll get rid of it. Stop lying! I want the truth! Now, let's see if we can avoid the apocalypse altogether. Here's another episode of Macro and Cheese with your host, Steve Grumbine. All right, this is Steve with Macro and Cheese. You might know that Real Progressives does a webinar series, RP Live, with some of our favorite podcast guests. It's a great way for the community to engage with them. This week, we're bringing you our most recent RP Live with Michael Hudson. Michael prefers the Q&A format, and if you know Michael, you know every one of his answers is a lesson in and of itself. So without further ado, we bring you Inside a Fail State, Michael Hudson, Q&A. My name's Virginia with Real Progressives. With me is my co-host, Tommy John, and our good friend, Michael Hudson, our guest of honor tonight. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And a big shout out to the Michael Hudson Patreon crew. I see some of them in the chat. Thanks for coming, guys. If you're not familiar, we're Real Progressives. We have a website realprogressives.org and it's just a treasure trove of all kinds of resources revolutionary stuff you're not going to find anywhere else including our flagship podcast macro and cheese which drops every saturday morning at 8 a.m eastern and we're approaching 250 episodes and every one of them is just an education in an hour also the big cheese steve grumbine here has a weekly Monday, Wednesday, Friday show called the Rogue Scholar at noon Eastern. Again, check us out at the realprogressives.org. We have a, a Patreon, which is patreon.com slash realprogressives. If you feel like chipping in a few bucks to help the cause and also a PayPal. We're always looking for some volunteers to help us spread the word. So go to the website, check our stuff out, sign up and get on board. It's Real Progress in Action on YouTube, and we also have Real Progressives on YouTube, but it seems like more of the regular content is going on Real Progress in Action. Check us out on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, everywhere else. We're all over the place. And I think that's all I got, and I'm going to hand it over to Momrad to introduce our guest. Go ahead, Momrad. Let's do this. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about Michael and how to support his work. Michael Hudgen is president of the Institute for the Study of Long-Term Economic Trends. He's a Wall Street financial analyst, distinguished research professor of economics at UMKC at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. All of us MMTers are well familiar with that institution. He's the author of Super Imperialism, the Economic Strategy of American Empire, and Forgive Them Their Debts. J is for junk economics, the destiny of civilization, finance, capitalism, industrial capitalism, or socialism, and many, many more. You can purchase the books I just mentioned on the Real Progressives website. We're part of the bookshop.org, and so we have our own little RP bookshop as part of that. Go to our website, use the media drop-down arrow, and you'll see RP Bookshop as one of the selections. 
Now, Michael's work you can find on his website. Actually, if you just enter Michael Hudson into Google search, it's the first thing that comes up. The other thing is you can support Michael on Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Michael Hudson. And Michael does a Q&A very much like this four times a year for his Patreon supporters. It's a lot of fun. Some of us have been going and it's a great chance again to ask him questions. As you all know, Michael is so unique and has such a unique perspective on the world that really helps draw the connections. So he's definitely worth listening to. Michael, welcome. Thanks for having me. Great. We're going to be talking about the U.S. as a failed state. You did an interview with Steve Grumbine on our Macro and Cheese podcast, and I hope everybody had a chance to listen to that because we want to stay within that topic, within that subject area. And we have friends here from March for Medicare for All and hopefully National Single Payer. And so one of the things some of us are very focused on is how to discuss health care, how to discuss universal single-payer health care for the United States. And, Michael, I'm going to start with a question that we hear all the time when we talk about that. The first thing you come up against is, how are you going to pay for it? You're going to have to raise taxes. We want to know how to answer that question, because we know that the U.S. government doesn't need our tax dollars to pay for social programs, but most people believe it does. There's two aspects to the question. First, about the health care. Already in the 19th century, the idea of public health care was a conservative idea. Benjamin Disraeli said, health, all is health. And he realized that if the government would provide health care at public expense, labor would be much healthier, its productivity would go up, and the industrial capitalists of England would have to pay less money on balance for healthy labor than unhealthy labor. Same thing that happened in the United States. It was protectionists and the Republicans that backed public investment in health labor on the grounds that if the public sector financed health labor, then the private investors, the capitalists, would not have to pay for health care and the workers would not have to pay for health care. Privatizing health care means that both the corporate sector and the employers have to pay for the health care, and that raises the minimum wage that employers have to pay. And the fact that health care is 18% of America's GDP helps price America out of the world market. What Americans pay in health care is larger than labor in many African or Latin American or Asian countries get paid. And there is no way that the United States can reindustrialize as long as it's leaving health care, education, and other basic needs as privatized to be paid out of the labor budget instead of by the government. So then we get to the question that you raised, how does the government do it? Well, governments can finance health care in the same way that they finance wars. They can simply print the money. If they borrow the money from wealthy investors or from banks simply creating credit on their keyboards, the government then have to pay interest. But just like banks can create credit on a keyboard when you go into a bank, the government can do the same thing. Just as the government of America financed a civil war by printing greenbacks, it can print the money to pay for the health care. And in fact, it was first Dick Cheney and then Donald Trump that says deficits don't matter. Cheney and Trump said we can pay as much as we want for the military budget simply by monetizing it, by having the Federal Reserve create money. We at UMKC have suggested the Treasury could simply print a coin about this big of platinum and say, this coin is worth a trillion dollars. We're depositing it in the Fed to draw on. And all of a sudden, you have a trillion dollars borrowing power. That, in effect, is what the U.S. already has been doing under the Bush tax cuts 
and the Trump tax cuts and the Biden Democrats that said we have to keep the tax cuts that the Republicans do or else voters won't support us. It's basically the Democrats that have been fighting against the idea that you can simply print the money if you're the government, just like a commercial bank creates credit. And the problem is, right now, you have President Biden saying, we're going to have to vastly increase the military budget in order to replace all of the armaments that have been used up in the war against Russia in Ukraine. And because this is going to increase military spending, we've got to cut back social spending. And that basically is the democratic platform, and it's completely unnecessary. It's a pretense that the country can afford armament, can afford tax cuts for the wealthiest families, but it cannot afford any kind of social spending for people who have less wealth than the top 10% of the population. This September, the suspension of debt service for student loans is going to end, and you're all of a sudden going to have a huge burden on families that have already been strapped for debt with their credit card debt, their mortgage debt, their automobile loans, their medical payments. Now they're going to have to all of a sudden resume paying the student loans that President Biden took the lead in making sure that these loans could not be wiped out in bankruptcy, unlike all other loans. The debts to the United States under President Biden's leadership in the early 2000s are treated as sacrosanct. And it really shows you that without a change in the monetary philosophy, how is money created, you're going to make the country a failed state because there's no way that America can reindustrialize and at the same time make labor pay these added expenses for health care, education, and other basic social needs. A heck of a tool for employers to have health care to hold over your head. And you hear, we're going to have to raise taxes and half the people shut down. And they're like, ah, I'm not interested. And if they understood that we don't have to raise taxes to get health care. Well, Stephanie yeah. Kelton has explained all this when she was yeah. working for Bernie Sanders. And what's called the Progressive Caucus used to support it before they all jumped on board with the Pentagon. And the Progressive Caucus now says, well, yeah, let's fight Russia. They've completely dropped their progressiveness. And what passed for the Progressive Caucus and the left in America is now on the right wing of the spectrum. And it's the conservatives, the Donald Trump, the Cheney, the right wing Republicans that are realizing that you don't have to tax the population in order to run deficit spending. I have to add something to that question. And this is really for me because I'm very confused about how the Federal Reserve works. And in your interview with Steve Grumbine on Macro and Cheese, you referred to borrowing from other countries, from banks, from billionaires to pay for deficit spending. I know you don't mean borrowing like if I borrowed $10 from you for a hamburger. I know it's a different kind of borrowing because it's not literally that they need it or a city or company issuing bonds because they need to borrow money. But can you explain that so people understand that the language is used in different ways and it's very confusing for lay people? Well, when lay people and when your audience goes to the bank and they put a deposit in their savings account or their checking account, they don't say the bank is borrowing from me. They think of themselves as saving. The United States doesn't have to borrow a penny from foreign countries in euros or yen or pesos or any other currency. But it does have a very different problem that has nothing to do with borrowing. The United States is running a huge balance of payments deficit. And since the Korean War, 1950, almost the entire balance of payments deficit has been military in character. So what happens is the United States spends these dollars abroad throughout its 800 bases throughout the world. These bases 
all this costs money and they have to spend it locally. And the local recipients of this money take the dollars and they remit them to their head offices in France or Germany or Japan or China. And the central banks of these countries say, what are we going to do with all these dollar payments? Well, there's very little that they can do with them. And so the only thing they can do to keep safe with these payments is to deposit them in the United States. But they don't want to deposit them in commercial banks because they could put it in Silicon Valley Bank and just be wiped out. So what they do is they spend their dollars in their international financial reserves by buying treasury bonds or treasury yeah. bills. So the United States has to provide a vehicle for these countries to save all of the surplus dollars that the United States spends militarily. So the United States acts as a savings bank for foreign central banks that receive more dollars than they spend. And the active factor in all this is the U.S. deficit pumps dollars into the economy. The dollars have to come back to the United States. And the United States accepts them as a deposit. And the deposit is a U.S. Treasury obligation that's held by them. So it's not that the U.S. Treasury says, we have to go out and borrow money from you guys. The problem is that these guys say, well, we have a surplus of dollars. We don't want the dollars because we think you're crooks. We've seen you just grab all of Russia's savings. You told England, grab all of Venezuela's gold. You guys are pirates. We don't want to hold dollars anymore. We want to de-dollarize. So what they're doing is winding down their dollar deposits here. They don't want to hold their dollars in the United States because President Biden says the yellow peril is our number one enemy. So China says, well, if we're their number one enemy, and he says it again and again and again, week after week, then they're going to treat us like they treat Russia. We'd better get all our money out of the United States. We'd better de-dollarize, and we'd better work with Russia, Iran, and the BRICS countries to have some alternative way so that we don't have to use the United States as a savings bank for these garbage dollars to put military bases around us where they say they're going to bomb us if we don't follow policies that President Biden's advisors support. So instead of borrowing from them, they're trying to decouple. They're trying to de-dollarize. The world is dividing into really two parts. The United States and Europe, which the head of the European Union, Borrell, calls the garden, and there's the rest of the world, which he calls the jungle, which shows the racist character that the Anglo-Saxon and the white population has toward the global majority, which is the term that President Putin and others have been using for the majority of people. At any rate, I've diverged a little bit, but we don't borrow. Other people have used us as a bank, just as when you go to a bank, put money in your savings deposit. The bank doesn't borrow from you. You're lending money to the bank. Other countries are lending money to the United States. They want to stop doing that because the United States is doing very bad things with the money they're lending. The United States is surrounding them with military and say, we're going to use force. We're going to use it to hurt you because you're our enemy. And if the United States declares all the rest of the world to be the jungle, the enemy, you can imagine the motivation foreign central banks and governments have to break free of the dollar. And my book, Super Imperialism, explains all of this balance of payments aspect to this. Michael, when you say other countries don't want to, quote unquote, lend, but isn't it also banks and billionaires? The way Stephanie Kelton explains it or describes it is that we're basically giving these treasury bonds as free interest to the banks and billionaires. Yeah. And so again, it's not really lending, but your question was about the balance of payments. And I think you said, do we borrow from other countries? Right. Stephanie tries to keep the discussion within the domestic economy so we don't complicate things by talking about the balance of payments. But Stephanie's quite right. Why should the government borrow from the billionaires and pay them rising interest rates when the government can simply print the money? During the Civil War, it didn't borrow because there wasn't any money to borrow. And when World War I broke out, 
all of the observers in Germany, France, England said, well, the war can't last more than six months because there's no money, not enough money to lend us. And yet the war went on year after year by all of the government simply printing the money. If you can do that to finance wars, why can't you do that to finance education, healthcare, and social spending? Why do you only create money to fight other countries instead of help your own economy? Well, the answer is class war, as Stephanie said. Absolutely. Right now, we're going to go to Thomas Jordan. Hi, thank you guys. And Michael, I'm a big fan of your work and thank you for all that you do. It's kind of a general question. The first one is, do you think there'll ever come a point where the treasury can just reset the national debt? And do you see the U.S. dollar collapsing in the near future? I don't see the U.S. dollar collapsing. It's going to continue to be used no matter what. And we're certainly getting a huge inflow from Europe. What's called the war in Ukraine is really America's war against Europe to basically financially colonize it. And we've made Europe much more dependent on the United States for arms, for energy, for just about anything. We've imposed special tariffs on European industrial exports. So we're going to be getting a huge inflow from Europe, which is a failed continent when you talk about it economically. Regarding writing down the debt, there's no particular need to write down the debt. The debt is more or less sacrosanct. And because the debt is owed overwhelmingly to the wealthiest people, and the wealthiest people are the donor class, the wealthiest people finance who's going to be on the Supreme Court, who's going to be running for Congress, who are the politicians that we're going to back, who are the judges that we're going to back. You can be sure that the government may not pay Social Security to the workers and the wage earners. It may not pay Medicare and Medicaid, but the one thing that is sacrosanct is debts owed to the upper 10%. Absolutely. We've got one here from William Gills. William asks, I live in Ecuador, which uses the dollar, the U.S. dollar. What are the pros and cons of changing back to its own currency, the Sucre? I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Also, Argentina has several exchange rates for its peso. The official rate, a parallel unofficial rate, a rate for the agriculture sector for soya exports. Some want Argentina to get rid of the peso and use only the dollar, as in Ecuador. Is that a good idea? That's a destructive idea. And Argentina used to use the dollar. What that means is that for every dollar of its currency, Argentina has to obtain these dollars. How does it obtain these dollars? that it's going to use as its currency. Either it exports more grain or beef, or it sells off its public domain. It sells off its land. It sells off its public utilities to get the dollars. Using the dollar or any foreign currency means that it has to essentially give exports and sell its economy for nothing, just to use the foreign dollars that it could use itself. Same thing with Ecuador. Ecuador did have a left-wing president, but you had him replaced by a right-wing person that said all of Ecuador's export proceeds have to be turned over to the U.S. Treasury for its international spending, mainly on war. Ecuador is going to give its entire economic surplus to finance America's Cold War. Argentina, the right-wing there, says let's use our surplus to finance the Cold War. Let's not create our own economy. We have to maintain austerity here if we really want to crush the working class and and the agricultural class and prevent the economy from getting rich so that we can lord it over the rest of the economy. That was discussed way back in their failed dollarization policy of the 1990s. And it's the same thing. No country should borrow in another country's currency, as Argentina and Ecuador did. If you use dollars, then the government can't do what we were just talking about. If you use dollars as your currency, you can't just print them to spend because you can't create dollars. Only the United States can create dollars. And if you use your own currency, pesos or whatever, then you can create as many as you want, which is the way things should be. So 
using the dollar is giving up national sovereignty. And one of the classic definitions of a state is a state has the power to create its own money. Giving up that power means that Argentina and Ecuador are not states. They're colonies, financial colonies and monetary colonies of the United States, not independent states. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to call on our friend Flo Florencia, who, Michael, you met at one of our chats after your Patreon Q&A. She's the one who's from the Vancouver area in Canada. Oh, so, right. Hello. Dor, yes. Hello, Michael. The Canadian Trotskyist here. You answered actually quite a few of my questions already that I had in the Q&A about the balance of payments issue. Any more that you want to say on that, I think, is always helpful. I'd like to hear more on that. But also... I think I heard you say that once that QE didn't add to the money supply, but shifted things around the balance sheet. So I was curious, what's the difference between QE and printing money? And what do you mean when you say printing money? Well, the quantitative easing was simply creating credit at the Federal Reserve for banks. The banks were able to turn over their assets as deposits at the Federal Reserve. They didn't deposit money at the Fed. They turned over their mortgages, their junk bonds, all sorts of things, and got credit at the original purchase price from the Fed. And that way, the Fed kept extending the credit to the banks to go out and lend more and more. And because the assets equal the liability in this kind of swap, it is not a creation of the money supply. It's not money that's going to be spent on goods and services. It was simply a balance sheet swap of a deposit of one form for an asset in another form. Balance sheets balance. And there was no increase in the money supply that people think of. The banks did have more credit, but the credits that banks create were mortgage credit and credits to buy stocks and bonds. There was very little bank credit for actual spending on goods and services. So the important thing to understand that you're not taught in school is the economy is in two sectors. The production and consumption sector that you all think of as the real economy. And there's the economy of property and debt and loans and the financial sector of assets and liabilities, of debts and what people owe is superimposed on this basic real economy of production and consumption. And money is spent in the real economy, but bank credit is spent really just to increase the debt overhead in the economy, the overhead of mortgage debt, of corporate debt, and speculative debt. Banks will lend money to private capital companies to loot the economy and drive them bankrupt. That's one of the most profitable sectors of bank lending. And the financial sector is basically predatory on the real economy. And people think that if quantitative easing creates credit, it must be inflationary. It's actually deflationary because the banks use all of this credit they have to increase debt on the economy. And the debts have to be paid not only with interest, but amortization. And so the more bank credit there is, the more debt there is because a bank credit is somebody else's debt, namely people who buy houses on mortgage or corporate raiders who borrow to buy companies and empty them out. So you have to understand how the economic system is multi-layered, and that's not what is taught in school in classical economics. They don't acknowledge that there's the asset and debt economy, the balance sheet economy, and the goods and service economy. Thank you very much. It's very complicated. Yeah. Randy Ray and the Levy Institute have given an example of tracing where did all this quantitative easing money under Obama go for? And you can follow it all in the very detailed analysis that he has. Wall Street on Parade is another site that explains all of this. It's very technical. And I could just say, no matter how clearly I say it, you have to rewire your brain to think in terms of the two-sector economy. Excellent. 
Next up, we have a friend of the show, Elizabeth, with a question. Can you please explain how de-dollarization in the geopolitical economy does not impact domestic spend, i.e. investing in healthcare, education, housing, climate, infrastructure, similar to Roosevelt's New Deal? And also, Christina asks, for the record, how much does de-dollarization affect regular Americans in the USA? Or is it irrelevant? It's easier to think of it as irrelevant than to spend the enormous difficulty of trying to figure out the indirect effects. There is no direct effect at all. Any effect is indirect. De-dollarization isn't simply moving out of the dollar. It creates a whole different kind of economy for the rest of the world. It's a different economic philosophy. It's basically a socialist economy versus a neo-feudal economy. It's an economy where governments are trading among themselves. It's an economy where governments are trying to steer their economic growth to benefit the overall population, to benefit the wage-earning population, to make labor more productive. It's a mixed economy where the governments are providing the basic infrastructure for health, education, transportation, communications, instead of leaving all of this privatized. So it's part of the world dividing into America, which is basically Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. If you want to see why America is failing, the topic of this show, look at what happened to England after Margaret Thatcher and the much more reactionary left wing of the spectrum. Under Tony Blair, under labor, the left wing was much more anti-labor, ambitious, and pro-financial than the conservatives ever could have been. If you're really going to fight against labor and against the working class, you need a President Obama to do that. You need a President Clinton to do that. You need a Joe Biden to do that. Only the Democrats can disable the labor union opposition and labor's opposition to really crush it. And you're having right now in the United States a class war that's the most vicious since the late 19th century. And the result is that the economy is grinding to a halt. Other countries are trying to avoid forcing their labor force, their wage earners, to break even by going into debt, by going into debt for their health care, for their education, because they provide health care and education at public expense. They're trying to prevent a housing bubble. They're trying to essentially use the government to promote economic growth instead of simply to suck the surplus out of the economy and give it to the 10% of the people who are the donor class. So it's not only moving out of the dollars as such, it's a different economic philosophy. And the result is, in the speeches of China, saying, well, wait a minute, you just had Janet Yellen, probably the most vicious woman official since Madeleine Albright, go to China and say, we've got to separate. We're here, as President Biden said, she explained to them, you are our enemy, and we're not trying to hurt you, it's just national security. And anything that we import from you makes us dependent on you on national security grounds. We're going to completely change our philosophy and our tariff policy, and we're going to raise tariffs against you. Our objective is to make the living costs in America higher by producing at home. So the consumer price index is going to go way up. And she said, we're not going to export anything to you, even if we export grain for you. That's a national security risk because some of your grain may be to support a soldier. And maybe one of your soldiers is going to just invade Los Angeles. Anything we export to you is potentially a military we think that you're going to invade us just like we thought Vietnam was going to invade us. And if we don't stop them in Vietnam, they're going to stop here. Well, if we don't stop you in China, we're going to have to fight you in Los Angeles. We're going to completely cut our relations with you as much as possible, except to the extent that we can hurt you. Well, she didn't say those words, but that was my uh, translation from the Chinese back into English, you could say. And if you read what she said, it's utter viciousness. That means you can say goodbye to imports from China. There's going to be a bonanza for monopolies in the United States. The Biden administration basically has the policy. Computer technology has to be monopolized. Everything basically we need has to be even more monopolized 
than it is today. And we're supporting monopolies and we're calling it anti-monopoly because voters want us to call it anti-monopoly, but we're really going to be anti-labor pro-monopoly. That's basically the Bidenomics. Thank you, Michael. Now we have Carl Sanchez from your Patreon group. Hi, Carl. One of the questions I had was, in relation to the Ecuadorian and Argentinian thing, would that mean that all the Euro nations are colonial nations to the European Union because they're all holding the Euro and not their own domestic currency anymore? No. The Euro was misstructured, basically. You wouldn't call it colonial. It's an artificial structure. The problem is that it's not really much of a union. For instance, Germany says it cannot run a domestic budget deficit. And the European rules say, we're all going to use the euro domestically for our money. They don't use the German mark or the Italian lira. But the problem is they all agreed not to run a budget deficit of more than 3% of their GDP. Well, that's not very much. America runs a much bigger deficit. And if you're Italy and you really need the government to create more money by running a deficit, the European Union prevents it. The way in which the euro was designed was to prevent European governments from using modern monetary theory to limit their ability to do anything under monetary theory. So this is what bankrupted Greece. You're seeing Germany today saying, we have to balance the budget. We're going to very, very sharply increase our military spending. We also have been subsidizing our consumers and small industry with the gas that we're now paying six times as much to the United States as we were paying to Russia before. So we're using a huge subsidy. We're going to have to drastically cut back German spending, social programs. Well, this means that the German economy is going to shrink and shrink and shrink. And because its energy prices have been sextupled as a result of the sanctions that Germany's agreed to put on Russia's energy imports, and that Germany went along with America's blowing up of the Nord Stream pipeline, you're having German heavy industry go out of business. Well, not only does the steelmaking industry go out of business because it needs energy in order to heat the steel, but without the steel, it's not going to have much of an armaments industry. Its fertilizer industry and chemical companies is basically shrunken as a result of no gas coming in from Germany to make the fertilizer. So the result is that the economy is the opposite of everything Keynes was talking about in increasing the demand to support economic growth. Germany's economic philosophy has always been to shrink demand. And that's because it was basically designed at the University of Chicago by anti-labor economists, essentially, specifically, to prevent Europe from ever becoming an independent economic power that would be a rival to United States industry, United States agriculture, or the United States economy in any way at all. So you could say that Europe, led by Germany, has created intellectual suicide. And the question before about, well, what does it mean to de-dollarize the economy? What it really means is to de-dollarize would be to have a different economic philosophy and a different philosophy of money creation. And the euro is a part of the American monetarist economic philosophy, the opposite of MMT. And Europe is a result of the war of America against Europe in Ukraine, you're having Europe not only shrinking, but becoming much more dependent on the United States for almost everything. Right. That's what I see. I see the candle burning at both ends in Europe, essentially. There's a few nations that are bucking that system, Hungary and Austria, maybe Slovakia. There's a word that there's a new gas field off of Romania and the Black Sea that might end up tying in with Turkey as an interesting gas up for the Balkans. So Europe's going to bifurcate into who knows how many different segments, but the logical thing seems to be for the Europeans to dump the Euro, go back to their national currencies and go back to financing their own way by using their treasuries as their national bank. 
and developing in that manner. That would at least enable them to make a new beginning. Then they can join the BRICS. Exactly. And that's how I see what's happening geopolitically is that we have essentially two geopolitical blocks with the multipolar block versus the Al Al U.S. Empire block. And eventually the European members of that block, the latter block, are going to drift away because they can't make it and their people revolt and change the governments and force them to leave and join the multipolar block. At least that's what I hope will happen over time here. Well, when Mr. Burrell says that Europe is the garden, he really implies the U.S. is the gardener. So if Europe is the garden, America is the gardener and gets the crops. The jungle is welcoming them, but they don't want to go into the jungle where all the energy and the new seed varieties are. Yeah, it's a, an interesting situation. You also recently had a podcast with Bill Black. I was yes. wondering if you'd repeat for our audience what you and Bill Black concluded was the controlling entity of the United States. I guess he'd say crime. <laughs> Can you remind me of what I... It was the bankers control. The bankers control the yes. government. Or in other words, Wall Street is the government. That's right. When people say, doesn't the government control Wall Street? Bill and I are in agreement that it's the financial class that controls the government. And America is becoming a centrally planned economy, but the planning has been moved out of Washington into Wall Street and other financial centers. And if you look at how the Federal Reserve was created in 1913, it was explicitly created by the banks to take monetary policy out of Washington. And in fact, the Treasury Secretary was not even permitted to be a member of the Federal Reserve Board. The Fed was shifted to the financial centers. New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, San Francisco, Denver. The whole idea was to put the commercial banks in control, not the treasury. Basically, what is it that steers an economy? It's creation of money and credit. Where is it going to be spent mm -hmm. on? If you leave the allocation of credit to the bankers, then you're going to leave forward planning to the bankers, and they become the planners. The problem is, what do bankers create credit for? They don't create credit for the production and consumption economy. They create mortgage credit to keep inflating the price of housing. They create credit to lend to private capital to buy out companies and take them private, load them down with debt, and leave them as bankrupt shells. None of that helps the economy, and there's really nothing the government can do because they say, well, that's private enterprise. We can't really control the financial sector. Even though nominally it was the government that named Alan Greenspan and his successors to be the head of the Federal Reserve, it was the banks, the donor class, that told the government, here is who we want you to nominate as the Federal Reserve head, somebody who will let us do whatever we want, someone who basically will acknowledge that crime is really part of the economy. Looting is part of the economy. As a matter of fact, crime is one of the biggest sectors. Even though it's not in GDP, it's one of the biggest and certainly most profitable sectors. And we want you to let our free market financial predators make the laws and decide who gets the credit and who doesn't get the credit. And that's what happened. Yeah. Recently, there was a very good article about the creaming of Heroin profits and cycling through the big banks uh, uh -huh. and the reason for the continuation of Afghanistan was continue that financial flow. Yep. We land side. I suppose the people on January 6th that went to the Capitol should have gone to Wall Street. I think that would probably been a much better effort on their part to invade Wall uh -huh. Street versus the Capitol building. But it's so amorphous. Where on earth do they go? It's so amorphous, and you have to have an intellectual understanding of how the economy works as an overall social system to do that, and that's not what's taught in schools. I had worked on Wall Street before I took a PhD in economics, and I think I got a C-plus in the money and banking course because the professor said I just didn't get it. I didn't agree with his idea 
of how banks worked. And I pointed out that I actually worked for a bank and here's how they worked. And he said, I never heard of that idea. And I'm sure he never did hear of ideas that if they can give the Nobel Prize to Paul Krugman, who said that what he was told in school was just don't talk about money. You know that not understanding how banks work is a precondition for academic appreciation. All right. Excellent. Our next question is from Tusker. Tusker asks, if the U.S. went to war with China over Taiwan, what impacts would this have on the global economy and how bad could it possibly get? <laughs> there's no way there's going to be a war with Taiwan. The United States is trying to do what it can by trying to separate the Taiwanese, but it's not going to happen. There's very little that the United States can do. It's muscle bound. The United States has only one weapon to use in any war, the hydrogen bomb. It has nothing in between your fist and the hydrogen bomb. There's a whole gap. We've just seen that in the war in Ukraine. The United States doesn't have an army to invade any other country anymore. You're never going to have another Vietnam because you're never going to have a draft again. You're hardly even going to have an Iraq or a Libya or a Syria because they're not going to be able to recruit terrorists to the extent that they did before. So the Americans have atomic submarines, they have missiles, they have bombs, but there's no way that they can fight with anything else. Well, what do you think Taiwan is going to do? Taiwan isn't going to invade China, and China is not going to invade Taiwan. The United States is simply trying to stir up trouble there, but it's really not getting any takers. China's very quickly consolidating its position. America has very little to offer Taiwan. China has much more to offer Taiwan, and Taiwan already has very large investments in China. It wants to preserve these investments. It may have investments in the United States too, but it is much more secure with its investments in China, and it has everything to gain by a closer relationship with China, and very little to gain as the United States economy becomes more protectionist. You are listening to Macro and Cheese, a podcast brought to you by Real Progressives, a nonprofit organization dedicated to teaching the masses about MMT or modern monetary theory. Please help our efforts and become a monthly donor at PayPal or Patreon. Like and follow our pages on Facebook and YouTube, and follow us on TikTok, Twitter, Twitch, Rockfin, and Instagram. All right, we've got a friend of the show here, Cheryl Van Epps. Okay, so we hear from Biden and AOC and others that we are doing just fine. I am aware of the genuine progress indicator, and I'm wondering what are the criteria for us to be able to say, yes, we're failing as a state? Well, so, as Tonto said to the Lone Ranger, what do you mean, we, white man? <laughs> Who is the we they're talking about? I think it's the donor class they're talking about. If you look at the Gallup poll, most people say that they're not feeling fine. I think if someone says to a poll taker they're not feeling fine, they're not feeling fine. So they're not part of the we that Biden and AOC are talking about. They're heavily in debt. Half of the American population doesn't have any savings at all. They're being squeezed by rising housing prices. Whether you're a renter or a mortgage debtor, rising interest rates, you're paying more. They're squeezed by rising health care prices. They're all of a sudden now having to pay the student loans. The monopolists are raising the prices for just about everything. A new word in the English language is profit inflation. 
meaning that companies are raising the prices because they're monopolies and just say, hey, if we raise the prices, we'll make bigger profits. And we don't have competition because the governments have stopped enforcing the anti-monopoly laws. So the we they're talking about are the monopolists, the bankers, and the 10% that are the main donor class to the Democratic Party and to the Republican Party, to be sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll use that in my arguments. <laughs> Just say, gee, you're so lucky to be so well-to-do. I bet you inherited a trust fund. <laughs> Michael, growing the GDP is not the same as doing better in the real economy. Why don't you talk about the difference between the real economy and the economy measured by the GDP? I think that might help people. Well, as I said, there are two sectors to what's called the economy. And people think that the economy and GDP is production of goods and services. But most of it is the fire sector. Finance, insurance, and real estate are where the GDP grows. So, for instance, interest charges that you pay, that's considered a financial service and fall behind in your payments. And all of a sudden, you have to pay a penalty rate that increases your charge from 19% a year to 29 or 30% a year, that's counted as financial services. And I asked the Department of Commerce desk that produces this, well, why do you call it a financial service? And they said, well, it's the banks that decide how much to charge for the penalty rate. So that's an increase in the service of collecting this added penalty. And for instance, when housing prices go up, and people have to borrow more to buy a house, 7% of the GDP is homeowners' imputed rent. And that means what would homeowners have to pay themselves as rent if instead of owning the homes, they rented it out? As the housing prices go up, homeowners say, well, our apartment or home is worth more and more and more, and their gain is considered part of GDP. And Obviously, that's not really a product. No money changes hand. They don't really get more of a service for their home. But that's considered an increase in GDP. You have a lot of flooding recently. Flooding is great for GDP because you have to rebuild all of these homes that have been flooded and that rebuilding the homes and replacing all of the destroyed products, that's considered GDP. Just like crime, when you're robbed or burgled and you have to replace something that's an increase in GDP. Military spending is an increase in GDP. So if people actually look at what the composition of GDP is and analyze it, they say, wait a minute, when we have to pay higher health care, that's 18% of GDP, as I mentioned before, but our health care isn't really as good as that of other countries. It's better than England, of course, but other countries have much lower death rates, lower death at birth rates, better health rates in Asia and other countries. So the more expensive health care becomes, the bigger GDP grows. And the more the housing prices rise, the more GDP grows. So really, the beneficiaries of GDP are the finance, insurance, and real estate sectors, not the industrial economy. The industrial portion of GDP is actually shrinking. But when consumers pay much more for monopoly goods, that GDP goes up. So basically, it's fictitious GDP. You could call it empty GDP. Thank you. Now, we have a question here from Tim. How are the U.S. going from 0% to 5% interest rates affect the upcoming labor strikes? How can labor movements succeed under such hostile and austere environments? Well, the problem that labor faces isn't really just the rise in interest rates. That affects primarily the financial sector more than labor. For instance, the railroad strike and the iron fist of the Democratic Party against labor unions, you saw when President Biden refused to support labor under the Obama administration, Obama had promised a card check, and then he did absolutely nothing. The Democratic Party is just as anti-labor as the Republican Party, but they say they're pro-labor, thinking that'll get the votes, and obviously the AFL-CIA is nothing like it was back in the 1930s. 
They used to be called labor fakers back then. The problem labor has is just it's within its own organization of its labor unions and the fact that you have a very hostile cabinet. For instance, the transportation secretary, Budigate, is about as anti-labor as you can possibly get, not supporting more labor for the railroads, not supporting more labor for the airlines and in the transportation. And you can look at Buttigieg fight against labor and fight for the railroads. And that of Biden is just an indication of why labor really needs not to be the handmaiden of the Democratic Party and to take an independent position. We're going to go to John Schreiner next. John asks, didn't QE inflate assets? which was a major factor fostering our current asset debt bubbles? That was the announced objective because the banks were underwater. They'd made so many junk loans that Obama, who started the process, said, how are we going to increase housing prices? So all these junk mortgages based on fictitious values that the crooked banks have done are going to make money. Instead of throwing the bankers in jail, Obama threw the victims of junk mortgages out of their homes. He said, let's do to the junk mortgage victims who have way inflated mortgages what I did in Chicago. I went to the black neighborhoods and I said, let's tear them all down. Let's gentrify them. And let's make billions of dollars for the Pritzker family and for the Crown family. And he came in and he said, look, I've made more and more money for the wealthy people by tearing down black and Hispanic neighborhoods. I can do that for the country what I did in Chicago. I can really just throw all of the black and Hispanic victims of redlining and junk mortgages out, and I can turn them over to Blackstone and BlackRock and to my biggest campaign contributors and make the economy and me richer. So basically, that's what happened in a nutshell. Yes, quantitative easing then said, well, instead of writing down the homes to the realistic market prices, that an honest appraisal would have gotten, that would require Obama to have thrown these bankers into jail. And the bankers were his campaign contributors. So he invited them to the White House and said, you know, boys, don't listen to what I'm telling the voters. I'm the only guy standing between you and the pitchforks. That's how he characterized his supporters as the mob with pitchforks. He knew who his enemy was. He had the Federal Reserve vastly increased the credit to inflate housing prices so that the banks got out of the negative equity position that Citigroup and Bank of America and other crooked banks had painted themselves into. And until people realize that we're still in the Obama depression, there has been no recovery as a result of the asset price inflation. Inflating asset prices makes the GDP look bigger, but it makes everybody poor because they have to pay to have access to these assets. Not only access to housing assets, but access to stocks and bonds whose dividend yield is lower and lower and lower as asset prices go up. So the result has been to impoverish the population. That was the objective of QE, and that is the objective of the Federal Reserve, and was the objective of Obama and Biden. Thank you, Michael. We have a question from Angela Birdwell. She's one of the volunteers at Real Progressives, and she asks, would it be accurate to say that de-dollarization is when countries attempt to become less dependent on U.S. dollars and become more self-sufficient in their own sovereign currency by maximizing their ability to deploy their own domestic goods and resources and reducing or limiting their dependency on foreign governments. How would this affect world trade? Would this mean there would be less global trade? Well, you're right about your definition of de-dollarization. That's a good definition. It will shift the direction of trade. The reason China has been spending so much effort and capital on the Belt and Road Initiative is to increase trade within Asia, Africa and Latin America. So all of this de-dollarization will increase trade, but it will not be trade with the United States and Europe. It will be trade for the world jungle, not for the world garden. Thank you. 
And we have a question from my sister-in-law, Anne Garneau. And by the way, Anne was born in Canada. She's an American citizen now, but she's from Canada. She asks, are credit union banks that are owned by their depositors a valid alternative to the big private banks? Sure. That's very good. I was a member of a credit union when I was on the Lower East Side. They're only a small portion of the whole credit system. But yes, of course, they're a valid alternative. The problem is they don't have anywhere near the amount of money that commercial banks have or not even as much as community banks have. So it would have to be a really big credit union. But yes, of course, they're an alternative that's especially good for small borrowers. Next up, we have Stephen Katz with a great question. Stephen asks, post-industrial capitalist states may be failing their people, but their rent-seeking activities are expanding exponentially worldwide. How can we, in the belly of the beast, stop this trend short of a revolution that is nowhere in sight? I can't figure out how. That's why most of my work is with foreign countries where something can actually be done to avoid post-industrialization. I do my best to work with American politicians and labor leaders and people who want to change things, but I don't think there's going to be much change in my lifetime. America is deindustrializing, and I don't see how it can possibly reindustrialize without a vast wipeout of debt and without a deprivatization of basic infrastructure and social needs. And it's nowhere near doing that. Other countries can write down their debt. Other countries can develop a social infrastructure to provide the health care and public education at subsidized rates, but it's not going to be done in the United States. As far as I can see, I don't see any political party that is aimed for that. I'm doing my best to have it introduced into the debates in the 2024 election, and we'll see what happens for that. But it'll take pretty much a revolution to bring it about because the violence has always been on the side of the rich against the majority. If you look through Roman history, the book that I just published, The Collapse of Antiquity, is how the wealthy people that have not earned their money, but just have privilege, income without working, that have used violence not the people who actually create wealth with their own labor, not the people who support themselves. It's always been free lunchers that have been willing to fight violently. And that was the story of Rome. It's the story of really all subsequent societies. Indeed. We have a question from Daniel. Can you explain the Chinese price deflation and how or if the Chinese lack the ability to give money to local jurisdictions is affecting the economy and why? Well, I haven't really studied the Chinese economy in detail. I've really focused almost all of my statistical studies on the West, and that's because I don't speak Chinese. And it's so complicated. There is a tension in China between the federal government and states and localities. And the idea that was basically a very good idea 30 years ago was let 100 flowers bloom. The Chinese central government said, let localities each try to develop in their own way. Let's see who's successful, just as we're letting private enterprise develop to see some kind of feedback so we can see who's successful. And that's certainly what has enabled Chinese technology and Chinese industry to grow. So they've pretty much left that to the state localities. Well, the problem is that China doesn't have a revenue sharing plan between the federal government and the localities to a large extent, so that localities have been financing their budgets very largely by selling off land to developers. And that's how China has been developing its enormous investment in real estate, which is what the Soviet Union was never able to do. The Soviet Union always had just an awful housing shortage, as did Central Europe under Soviet domination. Families had to share apartments. China was able to get basically apartments built, but what this did was strip away the assets of localities and turn it over to the privatizers who had bought 
the land from the localities. Well, the localities have the power to regain all of this by imposing a land tax. And if you impose a land tax, the reason housing prices have gone up in China is because the economy is more prosperous. People have more money in order to buy houses and to borrow from near banks and private lenders to buy houses at a rising price, just like they're able to do here and in other countries. And China has the ability to now tax this because if it doesn't tax the increase in land value, then the home buyer is going to use this rent to pay interest to the bank to buy the home whose land value is rising. That's the political issue that is in China today. Are they going to increase the land tax? Basically, the essence is you need a land tax to be federal so localities won't play themselves against each other as you have American states playing against each other for tax cuts and special privileges. So the question is, China would have a national land tax with revenue sharing with the localities. Well, how would the people who bought the houses pay the land tax and the banks? Well, you can't use the same rent to pay two different parties. Obviously, the banks would lose. The question is, would that really be such a bad idea? That's the kind of discussion that I have when I talk to my Chinese friends. Michael, we had some email questions for you. This one is from John Bloomfield. How would you propose a debt jubilee be implemented in the U.S.? Who would bear the loss of equity? Given that U.S. private debt consists of around 70% mortgage debt, 11% student debt, 9% auto loan, 6% credit card. Student debt is fundamentally government debt, so no equity problems there. But housing, auto, and credit card loans are more complex. Would one need to consider how long such debt has been outstanding? In other words, one-year housing mortgage? Does the mortgagee keep the house? Well, if you read Plutarch's Lives, Plutarch wrote the Live of Aegis and Cleomenus, who were the kings of Sparta in the 3rd century BC. And Sparta's kings decided that finally they had to cancel the debts because more and more Spartans were losing their land to the oligarchy. And he had a plan to cancel the debts of the people. But one of the officials said, well, this is great. You really want to cancel the debts on real estate because I bought a lot of real estate on credit. If you were to cancel the debts in the United States today, most of the debt, as you just pointed out correctly, owed is mortgage debt. If you canceled the debt of the absentee owners, you would make Donald Trump and the real estate owners the wealthiest people in the country. You don't want to cancel commercial debts or business debts among themselves. And for 2,000 years in the Bronze Age, the debts that were canceled were personal debts, agrarian debts, not business debts and certainly not real estate debts. You don't want to enrich and create a new landlord class that suddenly you can buy a $100 million building on Park Avenue with $1 down and borrow $100 million. Well, you don't want to erase the debt and suddenly give this man for $1 $100 million a building free. You want to leave that debt in place. And when you do cancel the debts, fortunately, the banks will be basically wiped out. It's a debt cancellation. And so the government will take them over and the government will basically say, well, you don't have the absentee owner owning the building and the property any longer. The debt cancellation would have to go hand in hand with the land tax. And the debts that you want to cancel are the debts that are owned by individuals, student debts at the top, credit card debt, automobile loans, personal debts. You want to lower the debt overhead on the wage earning class and the debt overhead of the corporate class accompanied by the government will recapture the economic rent that is paid to the banks for this debt will now be paid to the government as taxes. So a debt cancellation has to go hand in hand with a government recovery of this financialized rent 
as the form of a rent tax. So the rent that was formerly paid to the banks as debt service will now be paid to the state and local and federal government as the tax base. This is what Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, the entire 19th century was fought over getting rid of the landlord class and basically promoting owner-occupied buildings. That's the exact opposite direction in which the United States has been going in since the Obama administration, which is the Democrats say, we want to turn America into a landlord economy away from a home ownership economy. The way to cancel this is by a debt cancellation, replacing the commercial banks that'll no longer have the mortgage interest to back the deposits with the government taking them over as a public utility, making banks the kind of public utility that was expected in the 19th century. And in fact, that is what China has done, which has made China so successful in its use of credit creation in comparison to what the deindustrializing West has done. I compressed a lot of that, and I know it's hard to hear this, just saying it in a couple of sentences, it almost requires thinking about it for six months and rewiring the brain to get through it. And all I can do, if you want an elaboration, is to read the transcriptions of the interviews that I've done that are on my website. And I've spelled out these questions in my articles. I spelled it out in The Destiny of Civilization, a book that I wrote last year, in Killing the Host. My books spell out the answer in detail to what I've compressed. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to bring Flo on again because she has several more questions. I fired off a bunch of questions in the Q&A there, but I'll try and summarize it. And it's kind of along the lines of some stuff that I saw in the chat, too. There was a bit of an argument about the Federal Reserve and its role and its significance. And it got me thinking about the relationship between the state, regulated banks and financial institutions, and then maybe like private capital or shadow banking or these quasi financial agents. And what should we take away or how should we understand that dynamic or what is the relevant considerations there? Because it seems like there's always this bifurcation in these discussions about class power who's in charge, and then the more technocratic understanding of what's actually happening with the money. So what's your take on the relationship there and how should we understand it? The whole shadow banking issue is discussed a lot by Randy Ray and my Levy Institute colleagues. It's so technical. Anybody who is a creditor could be called a shadow banker because the credit system proliferates. But basically, it's the large banks that provide credit to brokerage firms, to all sorts of financial operators who try to make money with the credit they get. And they pay the large banks and make a profit by exploiting their customers more than they're being exploited by the large credit-creating banks. You said that the Treasury has been taken over by Wall Street, and that makes me think about it too, because I hear on the MMT side a lot, banks are federally chartered entities, so they're under the strict control of the government. But there seems to be a tension there. Who's really got the power? If you go to the Hollywood movies about local crime bosses, the crime bosses are all regulated by the police. The policeman always works for the crime family. That's a typical Hollywood plot. Anybody can get a charter, you pay the price of the charter. And if you cheat somebody of a million dollars, you actually have to pay a $10 million fine. So yes, there are checks and balances. For every million you steal or exploit or foreclose on, you pay maybe a $10 fine. That's the cost of doing business. The charter is a kind of license to do whatever you want to do. As long as the regulator is a member of your crime family and In America, the philosophy is every business gets to name the regulator of the business. They all get to have their brother or ideological relative as their regulator. So the regulation really doesn't work here. If it worked, you wouldn't have 
the Democratic or the Republican parties the way they were. You'd have a real government. So you talked about shadow banking. You have a shadow government. And it's the shadow government of the financially wealthy oligarchy that runs the country. If you think of America as an oligarchy, not a democracy, you'll begin to break the linguistic Orwellian doublethink that the papers use. I'll just end on this. It reminds me, there is a tension or a lot of the work of real progressives is trying to just look into bridging gaps or misunderstandings between Marxists and more MMT informed. This is a misunderstanding of Marxist. Could you elaborate? Well, that's actually what I was going to ask you. What do you think a lot of modern Marxists get wrong about money? Because there are still a few that are more pro UBI. I remember a couple of years ago going to a fight back educational and they were like, there is no magic money tree. But it seems like sometimes in the MMT crowd, what's missing is the analysis of class power and power dynamics. It's very funny you should say that because they're all followers of Hyman Minsky and Hyman Minsky was a Marxist. So he told me and so his family told me. There's one common denominator that I found among almost all the Marxists. They hate what Marx wrote about in volume two and volume three. They call themselves Marxists, but they only get through volume one. They think that what Marxism is, employers exploit wage labor by selling their product at a higher price than they pay labor. All that's correct. And that's why Marx wrote volume one of Capital. But then in volume two and three of Capital, he said, this is part of the overall problem of the economy. What makes capitalism revolutionary, Marx wrote, is that it's getting rid of the carryover of feudalism. The one thing industrial capitalism did that's idealist is it's getting rid of the landlord class by taxing away land rent. And that's why the very first plank of the Communist Manifesto nationalized the land and the land rent. The land rent should be the supply of the government. In volume three of Capital, Marx talked about the financial sector. And he said, finance is extraneous to the economy. It's not part of the production and consumption economy that I'm talking about in volume one between labor and industrial capital. It's the privilege, it's the assets and property in the form of financial claims as well as property ownership. And this is institutional in character. It's superimposed on the economy. And finance and compound interest grows exponentially with power of its own. And he explained all of this more than any one other writer of his time. He explained the dynamics of interest-bearing debt. Now, very often when I've gone to China and when Marxist friends of mine like David Harvey have gone to China, we've gone to Marxist conferences, and we talk about volume two and three of Capital, you could see the discomfort that people find. Now, when I was 10 years old, around 1950. I knew almost every major socialist leader in the country. Certainly in Chicago, I knew them all. And I'd go over to the house, and while they were all talking, I would sit at the bookcase, and I'd look at the books that I was familiar with, like the three-volume Charles Kerr version of Capital. And I'd always open them all, and I'd notice volumes two and three had never been opened or read. And so you could say there are two kinds of Marxists. They're volume one Marxists that really call themselves socialists, but they haven't really read Marx. And they're volume two and three Marxists that look at the economy as an overall political, economic, social system. Marx developed the systems analysis of capitalism, and he saw the way in which industrial capitalism was revolutionary. It solved the problem with the landlords, it was solving the problem with the banks in Germany by industrializing banks and using credit to finance industry, not for usury type banking that you had in England. And he said, now that those two problems have been solved, there's one thing that the 1848 bourgeois revolutions did not solve, and that's the labor capital problem. And I'm writing volume one to show the labor capital problem that even after you get rid of the landlords, you get rid of the predatory bankers, you still have to have fair employment situation between labor and capital. And that's what Marx's contribution that he emphasized in contract to what other 
people were emphasizing. Well, it's very hard to get Marxists to look at the financial aspects of the economy. By the time I went to work on Wall Street in 1960, throughout the 60s, the leading economists on Wall Street were Marxists. And we used to get together once or more often a month. And we'd be talking about what's happening financially with the U.S. economy. And very often we would refer to volume three of Capital. What did Marx say about this? And we sort of broke out laughing. Isn't that funny that here we are working for the big banks and the big investment banks and other companies. And we're talking about Marx. And we understand how the economy works because if we had an economics degree, we wouldn't understand why the economy works. And that's why they hire us Marxists to explain to them how the economy works, not the others. But the people who call themselves Marxists don't talk about what we're talking about, how the financial system works, how the rent extraction works, how rent is paid out into interest. We're sort of a dying breed of old Marxists. And I learned Marxism from my father and from my mentor, Terence McCarthy, who learned from his grandfather. So we're all basically Victorian era Marxists. We're all strobacks. And how do you get people to read Marx's theories of surplus value, which was really the first history of economics? When I taught national income analysis at the New School in the 70s, I used Marx's theories of surplus value as my textbook because Marx explained rent, interest, debt, dynamics, explained all of this. And you really have to look at how Marx was part of the whole 19th century economic ideological revolution and reformers in order to understand them. You can't just understand how the economy works by reading volume one. You not only have to read volume two and three of Capital, but all three volumes of Marx's Theories of Surplus Value to see what Adam Smith and Ricardo and Malthus and John Stuart Mill and all the other people that Marx analyzes. You have to understand the whole mentality of the 19th century as a reform movement. Certainly Minsky did, and his children told me that Minsky told them to read Marx. And obviously, the MMTers have not emphasized that because they want to be more widely expressed. And when you say Marxism in America, people think that it's something quite different than what Marx meant by Marxism. Absolutely. Michael, thank you. You spoke about debt and debt jubilees. Would you tell people about why you write about debt so much? Tell people about the book you're working on now and the other volumes related. I decided to become an economist. I talked with actually my Marxist friends, and we all saw that debt was the big problem that was going to trouble society. We were all volume three Marxists. And I went into Wall Street to understand how banking and debt worked. And I worked for Unitar in the late 1970s, writing about third world debt. Because when I worked at Chase Manhattan, one of my first jobs was to estimate whether Argentina and Brazil and Chile could pay their debt and how much they could afford to borrow. And of course, they couldn't afford to borrow much more. They were already loaned up. And I forecast that there was going to be a third world debt crisis. And that was in 1979. And that was at a meeting that Unitar had in Mexico City. There was a riot at the meeting. And I realized that this was really controversial. And I decided to begin writing a history of debt. As I began to write the history of debt, I found there were debt cancellations for thousands of years in the ancient Near East, but hardly anybody had written about it. So I got associated with Harvard for 25 years with the Peabody Museum, which is their archaeology department. And we set to work organizing a series of six colloquia to invite the leading Bronze Age and ancient historians from Sumer, Babylonia, Iran. Egypt, all of the other major countries to write, how did debt and money begin? How did economic account keeping begin? How did land tenure begin? And urbanization, privatization, how was labor organized? And these colloquia, we've now got a seriological profession in the Egyptology profession agrees with the analysis. Yes, there really were debt cancellations. Debt cancellations really kept the economy from polarizing. 
and I decided to write a history of debt. And the first volume was, And Forgive Them Their Debts. That's the volume of debt in the Bronze Age down through Judaism. And the academic articles that are the basis for these, the colloquium, will be published later this year. I'm finally doing the proofreading of the book now. My second volume of the history of debt is on Greece and Rome, and that was The Collapse of Antiquity that was published a few months ago. Martin Wolf in the Financial Times cited it on his summer reading list. He'd listed Forgiven Their Debts as one of his books of the year for the Financial Times a few years ago when it was out. And I'm now working on the third volume of debt from the medieval Europe down to World War I, down through the 19th century on how the church came under the Roman papacy. The Roman papacy had a problem. How do we get rid of all those Christians and turn life over to ourselves and the banks? And so the Roman papacy reversed all of the church teachings against usury and basically set out to make a deal with the Norman conquerors, the warlords, that they would bless the invader of England, William the Conqueror, if William would pay a tribute to Rome, they would back the conquerors of southern Italy and Sicily if they would become it. And immediately, once they backed the Norman invaders, they said, now we have to destroy the center of Christianity, Constantinople. We have to get rid of it. And that was the Crusades. And that ended up as part of the looting of Constantinople. But also, people don't realize most of the Crusades were against other Christian countries, against Christian countries that did not want to pay tribute to the Roman papacy. And the war against southern France, the Cathars, was one crusade. They kept trying to mount a crusade against Germany, the Holy Roman emperors that didn't want to pay tribute to Rome. All of these wars cost money. And so Rome went into an alliance with bankers from northern Italy and the Transalpine region and began to tax all of the churches throughout that part of Christianity controlled by the papacy to force them to borrow at very high interest rates from the bankers that were sponsored by the papacy. And instead of excommunicating the bankers who charged usury, the popes excommunicated people who would not pay usury to the bankers. And all of this has been erased from history. It was all written by the historians of the time, Matthew Paris and other authors who wrote the Annals and the histories of the time. But it's been omitted, and most people have the idea, well, wait a minute, weren't the Jews the usurers? Isn't that why they were expelled from England and France? Well, the Jews were expelled from England and France because they were not usurers, because they'd been driven out of business by the Italian bankers who didn't want a competition, basically, from Jewish merchants. They wanted to monopolize it. And by 1515, you had the bankers rise from the outskirts of society, the people who were banned under Christianity, to the papacy. It was a Medici who became Pope Leo X, who had a great papal meeting where essentially he erased the whole biblical teaching of usury. And the churchmen said, we're going to have two kinds of interest. There's usury, that's money you pay to the Jews, and there's interest, what you pay to the Christians. And will you pay much more money to the Christians as late fees and interest than you have to pay to the Jewish lenders? That's why we don't want Jewish money lenders, because they're underselling our main supporters, our donor class, our bankers. And so it was the Crusades that shaped the whole financialization of economies and the whole attack on Christianity that became the Catholic Church. Thank you, Michael. Will you tell people where to find your work? Tell them about your Patreon. Well, they can go to my website, which lists the Patreon site. They can read all the articles I've written on the website. You can go to Amazon or any of the other distributors, probably Abe's book and others, and you can buy my books. They're all in print right now. The prices are going to go up in a month because Amazon, I told you about 
the Biden administration has just told companies, use your monopoly power now before the election. Amazon has just increased its take, the commission that it insists, from 20% to 40%. That means that all the publishers in America, in order to break even, have to raise their book prices on hardbacks and paperbacks in order to pay Amazon the monopoly price that Biden has said, do it now while I'm still president and can protect you. How much are you going to contribute to my campaign? So buy them in a hurry before Biden give them enough power to raise the discount rate to 50%. One of our favorite MMT economists is Vado Kaboob, who's part of the Modern Money Network. And he talks a lot about abusive monopoly price setting and also about the global South, about all those issues of sovereignty and lack of sovereignty. So I urge people to look up his work. Also, I think we have 10 interviews with him on macro and cheese. Fidel has just left academia. He's gone to where he has a great position now to really be a major player in how the world economy is evolving. I'm so glad that people are finally recognizing his brilliance. It's wonderful. He's one of our MMT graduates. Yeah, great. John, do you want to say goodbye to everyone? Sure. I want to thank everybody. We always have the greatest attendees to these things. Everybody's so smart. Great questions. Thanks, guys. And a big thank you to Michael Hudson. We're so grateful for your generosity and your knowledge. When Steve first asked Michael if we could interview him for Macro and Cheese, Michael said, I don't do interviews on places that don't have transcripts. Well. You don't know this, Michael. We had already done about 80 weeks worth of macro and cheese episodes, and we scrambled to create transcripts for all of them. And since then, we have a transcript with every episode, and it's all thanks to you. Well, I hope I didn't say anything offensive. I hope you did. (laughs) I was hoping you would, too. (laughs) Check out our website, realprogressives.org. You can find all the stuff there. The Macro and Cheese Podcast, which drops every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Eastern. Come check us out. If you feel like throwing us a few bucks to help us keep getting this content out to you, it's patreon.com slash realprogressives, or you go to our website and there's a PayPal link or sign up and come volunteer and take my job. So please help us. We need help. And we love you guys. And Michael, thank you for your time. Yep. Somebody cue the music because we are out of here. Thank you so much. Take care, guys. Macro and Cheese is produced by Andy Kennedy. Descriptive writing by Virginia Cox and promotional artwork by Andy Kennedy. Macro and Cheese is publicly funded by our Real Progressive Patreon account. If you would like to donate to Macro and Cheese, please visit patreon.com slash real progressives. I want the truth!